Hello, everybody, and welcome to Empower Hour. I tell you, do we have so we so we, we were obviously chatting before the recording started. We're gonna have a great time. Mm-hmm. And these next few weeks are gonna be incredible. And I'll tell you about the next two weeks after we get done with this hour. But today we are gonna do a coaching spin on the old or on a Christmas carol that old thing that about Ebenezer Scrooge, although instead of the ghost of Christmas past, Christmas present and Christmas future, we're actually going to explore, are you living in the ghosts of your past or are you living in your present or are you living in the ghosts of your future? I got to record. It's about to be like... Right, I love it. Well, I know. I, right? I I do this every time. <laughs> so, again, in Empower Hour, right? This is our coaching takeoff on a Christmas Carol. And before we get, before we begin, I would like to introduce our ever so clever co-hosts of this. And we will start with the somewhat dark and grinchy Coach Angelito today. <laughs> I just love the edge. Your edge today is beautiful. I think Jim Carrey's dark and grinchy version is what I'm channeling. <laughs> well, as he's he, the only as dark he brings... and grinch. He's the only grinch that, we, that I know. Yeah, that's true. That's okay, true. Okay, bye. So, so tell us something grand about yourself this holiday season. Wow. Oh, wow. What a uh, curveball. Grand about myself. Or grinchy about yourself. It, it can either be grand or grinchy. We're going into the G realm today. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Let's <laughs> go. Cool. It's funny because the, the moment you said Grinch, I was like, oh, yes, okay. I know. And then I said Granny, you're like, oh. <laughs> well, no, uh, I'm not really a, a holiday kind of guy. <laughs> no. This is not a good start. Um, well, no, that's the truth. I'm not a holiday kind of guy. Um, like, the, I've got my whole thoughts on the whole Christmas season. However, the best part about uh, the holiday season is that I always spend it with my family. And family is a huge, huge part of the holidays. I could go without the the one day of Christmas and the tree and the gifts and all that stuff. Like, I just don't like what that's become. But the spirit of the holidays, uh, I could tot- I totally um, vibe with. I love it. And I, if I could just go caroling, if we could bring back caroling from like through the neighborhood, I would. Mm. But I don't know if that's possible in LA. I think <laughs> you'd get shot. shot. There's the Grinchy part. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Coach Amy, what is something grand or Grinchy about you today? And, and, and you guys notice, right? I have my little Shank doll. That should be the mascot. It is the mascot for today, right? <laughs> this is this is the goat, ghost of coaching past, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Okay. <laughs> Grand or Grinch? Well, so listening to Angelito, I I have a love-hate relationship with Christmas. Similar, I love the spending the time with the families. I love that we're going into our summer holidays here down under. And it is, that's a divine time of the year. And then you layer in Christmas. Uh, But I I enjoyed my sleep in this morning. I've got one child still at school, but two of them are on holidays now. So I'm thoroughly enjoying not having to be up to get them up and organised. And in that space, the other day, though, we went to buy my youngest uh, suit for his year six graduation and he wanted a full on suit. So we had to go to a bigger town because we live in a small town. There's no one to buy a suit in our local town. And we went down to one of the smaller uh, Westfield shopping centres in uh, New South Wales. And we got into the car park after we'd been through every frigging shop because buying a single suit wasn't an option because they didn't have the right sizing and stuff. So we, the jacket came from one place, the uh, shirt came from another, the trousers from somewhere. Oh, I'm just, I am done. And so we got into the car and I put on Oscar the Grouch's I Hate Christmas. <laughs> so that was how we left. 
<laughs> and then it went into other Christmas carols and I but I really have that love hate relationship with Christmas so I, I I love the time with my family I love the holidays I love the downtime I love this is a time of year where I dive into learning generally so I'm currently I've got three or four obsessions on the go that I'm learning and applying and playing with which is my taking what I learn and turning it into wisdom and this is definitely where I up level my wisdom I love that and then the dynamics of family dynamics and the dynamics of holidays and all of that comes in so I've got kind of grouch grinchiness combined with the grandness and yeah I don't know if that answers the question, but that's the answer you're getting. No, it answers it perfectly. I mean, it, I mean, had I known we'd gone this direction, I would have brought my Grinch hat because I actually have, and not only, I actually have two Grinch hats in case I lose one of them, because in years past, I get great joy of wearing it everywhere and having a frown and looking at people and just shaking their head and just watching the reaction of people. You know, because you have all the people. And I also have a Santa hat, but it's like you wear the Santa hat and everybody's just like, oh, that's like Mr. Happy. Um, so, and I don't like, I guess I'm I'm a little bit like both of you. Um, one of my families, if I lived closer, if they weren't 26 hours away, I would most definitely go there, um, especially this year. You know, today is day 30. You two know about my big discovery. Mm -hmm. Probably in the next month, I'll begin to get to a point that I can unroll it. But I will say that this has, has shifted my whole life. It has shifted mm -hmm. my coaching direction. I'm in the middle of writing a book. I'm in the middle of doing interviews because I'm finding there are a lot of people in a similar situation as I am. Yet this year... Yeah, you know something? I kind of like the, the one thing I like about the Grinch is that at the end, he kind of gets it, right? And that's the one thing I like. But I also love A Christmas Carol, and I love watching, especially a lot of the older ones. And, I was, and as, I, as I was thinking about our topic for Empower Hour today, here's one of the things as coaches, and whether you are a coach or you are somebody listening to this and it's like, do you live in the present? Are you haunted by the past or are you haunted by the future? So we're going to start. And I love that old, I especially love the old, like, like the older ones, because I just think back in the 50s and 60s, they recorded things better. Um, so as a disclaimer, I haven't seen a Christmas Carol, the original ones. I, I haven't seen that Christmas movie. I have seen the Doctor Who knockoff. Of okay. A Christmas oh, Carol. Oh, the Doctor Who knockoff. The Doctor Who Ooh. knockoff. Ooh, and I, I love that. That That is one of my, I watch every year at Christmas. We watch, uh, I watch, sometimes the kids stay with me. Generally they do like five minutes and then I'm like, all right, I give up on this, watching this together, go away, do your own thing. Cause they're not, as Doctor Who obsessed as I am, but I love the Doctor Who version of it. And okay. I've probably seen other like knockoff versions, but I don't think I've ever seen the original. So in the original, you have Ebenezer Scrooge, which is basically a tight, like, like he's somebody that life has disappointed him. And he literally just is a miserable character. And these days, I used to work quite a bit in addiction recovery. And by Christmas day, every single addiction center, at least here in the States will be filled like mm. to the brim or overflow. It's, the it's same, because, Danny. yeah, yeah. The stresses of the holiday mm. literally unwind people mm. that some of their coping mechanisms tend to go way overboard and as they go overboard they obsess in behavior that's negative mm -hmm. in any way but in our adventure as we think about coaching or as you think about where you are in life mm -hmm. do you live with the ghosts of your life past that's the first question is like, and, and, and when I talk about the ghosts of your life past, I'm talking about the successes of the past, 
I'm talking about the failures of the past and the greatest failure that I can think of is, um, is, is in the Napoleon Dynamite movie, Uncle Rico was always living in the past on the pass on the football pass that he never made. He was never able to grow beyond that. So one of the things is as a coach or as a human being this season, are you living in a not good way in the past? Coaches, what do you, when I say that, what do you, what, what comes to your mind? So my first thought, because I don't think living with the ghosts of the past is a bad thing, but being led by the ghosts of past and being consumed by the ghosts of past is where it becomes bad. I think we can learn from our past. I think there is a place for, we don't want to cut off our past completely, but to be consumed by and to only access the past and not learn from and not embrace and not be in the present is where we get held back. So I, I believe I do, because as you said, I like, yeah, I live with the ghosts of Christmas past. I live quite happily with my ghosts of Amy's past. I live in contentment. I learn from them. I listen to them. I am not led by them. They are not driving my decisions. They are not shaping my focus but they're there, then they're lovely companions on this journey. They are not, and they being past and future, they are companions on this journey. They are not the leaders of this journey. So this is my first thought that comes up as you're speaking. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I feel like if I allow myself to go there, I can go there, but uh, I don't. Um, so yeah, like, living in the past with all the work that uh, I've done mentally and just, mm -hmm. just self growth. And w from what I know to be true, it's uh, it's a stretch to live in the past and, and to take resources from the past that don't serve me. Yeah. Now, most people, I want to say 12 or 14 years ago, I began doing something that I call a completion ceremony. It's basically, a, it's a seven page workbook where I get to complete on the year. And the first time I did it, it was close to 15 years. Um, one of the things you know about me is oftentimes if I've expired about something, I will do the homework like to make sure that I really get it. And I literally, and I, and I think even the first year I probably did it two or three times to make sure that I was complete on the past because way, way too often, even as coaches, we tend to take not only the failures, but the successes and some, we drag this baggage. We drag this baggage from our past into our future. And, you know, I've, I've often seen like, it's like carrying a big Santa's bag that just weighs you down. I'm what curious, the, Jim, because yeah. you talk about the, the like I, the, the letting go of the failures, I believe most people will understand the, the completing the stuff that didn't work well, letting that go, letting that stay in the past. Yeah. Frequently when I've listened to you talk about this, though, you talk about leaving the successes in the past. I'm curious what has you choose to, and, and maybe I've misunderstood and I'm open to I've misunderstood, but I'm curious as to what has you uh, come from that angle and I, I don't know whether it's right or wrong at this point I just I, I'm looking to understand because leaving failures in the past I think we've all heard I think we can all see easily the mm -hmm. benefit of letting go of those attachments to the negativity but the mm -hmm. things that have worked really well for us what's the advantage of leaving them in the past or have I misunderstood what you're saying um, let me explain it. Then you can tell me whether you've misunderstood. I actually like completing everything. I like literally be, <laughs> be starting from Sorry. a blank slate because, because giggling, here's one of the of things. Course you do. Our, our success. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads us into where we're going in the next couple of weeks. I, it, it, you know something? I know it does lead us into where we're going the next two weeks. And those next two weeks are going to be so exciting. But here's one of the things to answer your question is like, the lessons learned from the successes is what I bring forward, but I let the successes go. So I literally create a clear slate by which to create the next year anew. Yep. Yep. 
I, I, and I know that this isn't going to help the audience or probably even Angelito, but I know with what you just said, I'm like, of course you do. And it now makes sense to me. I operate completely differently to that. And I know this is often how we play is that. So for me, the, the open loops and holding on to, uh, not so much holding on to the pain, mm-hmm. but the, the holding on to, holding on to the journey is actually quite beneficial for me, which I think is why I wasn't resonating with let go of the successes and leave them in the past, which is great. And this is one of the keys as coaches is that we want to be aware that there's not that one size fits all. This strategy works really well for you, Jim. And I understand that like that completion ceremony and untying the things that aren't helping us by all means, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I understand your perspective far more clearly. Well, I know that's not helpful. Can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Uh, what would cause someone to live in the past, Jim? Or Amy? I, I think, so this is going to go back to my concept of how we play in life. If you remember from Weeks Pack, I think life tends to be a game And I think children know how to play the game. They start the game, they get a group together, they have agreement on the rules, they have agreement when they begin playing. As they're playing, if if something needs to be changed, they do a timeout and they reset things. And then when the game is done, they declare the game done. As adults, though, we never declare games done. We live, we keep our failures alive. And at times we keep our successes alive. And I think we can, we, we can actually harm ourselves and our progress if we are doing nothing but having a deep reflection on something that was as opposed to living in the present and creating and then living from that creation. Do you think people actually um, actively sit and reflect and think about the past, um, like consciously, or they're just in a situation in their life that transports them there without even a conscious control of it? Like, that's why I ask, like, what situation would someone have to be in to either be living in the past, taking from the, or, you know, taking from the past or in the future or being in the present. Let's say, and, go ahead, Amy. And so I think it, to answer your question, Angelita, I think it can be both. Some people are doing it deliberately and they're going back to the past because they don't want to let go for some reason. I, I know I talked about it a couple of weeks ago, the scrapbooking stuff. I don't yeah, well, want to let go of that. Why would they be that. doing that? So mm-hmm. I don't want to yeah. let go. Yes. Yeah, so I don't want to let go of that identity. I liked who I was when I was a scrapbooking teacher. I liked the success that I had. I liked the accolades that I had. I don't want to let go of that. And my, uh, what a better word than fear, because it's not really a fear, but my concern, my worry, my my vague inclination, because it's a very mild thing, is that if I let go of my scrapbooking stuff, I will lose that part of myself. And so I hold on to that and I keep myself stuck in that past and it's not hurting me. I don't need to change it at this point. There's no, other than the hallway has stuff in it, there's no real impact on my life that is causing me pain enough to want to change it. So I hold on to that attachment because I like holding on to that version of me. The other piece that when you first asked the question that came up for me is people like familiar. The majority of people are not fond of change. Now we get changes all the time. So as a parent, my baby, like my tiny baby, my big baby is Mm -hmm. scaring the crap out of me becoming an adult, turning 18, having a driver's license. He can legally drink in Australia now. There's all of these things that are challenged. I want to hold on to the past. He was tiny. He fitted in my belly. I carried this baby. I gave birth to him. And I remember, so there is like, there is the ghost of Christmas. I liked that time when he was small and cute and he had curly hair. My baby, who is my youngest of four, he's graduating year six. I will have no more primary school from Friday he finishes. And there was a pic. Which also says you're getting old. 
Yeah, which also says I'm getting old. I like mature, the familiarity. Mature. Mature. Oh, oh, mature, <laughs> mature, mature, excuse me. Yeah. I, 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 I like the, the association of mature. I think we can get old without maturing, though. <laughs> um, but the, so what, um, when I picked him up from his graduation dinner last night, they'd given them all pictures of them in kindergarten. So they'd found all of the kids or from when they'd started at the school for the kids that had started a little bit so small and cute I love that time he was small and cute actually by kindergarten he was talking back but my like two and three year olds they were small and cute they were willing they saw me as a goddess and I was amazing and mum knows everything my kids don't see me like that anymore I want to hold on to that version of me that they saw through child eyes rather than teenage eyes because the version of me they see through teenage eyes is not one that I like confronting in the mirror. And so that familiarity, that comfort, that certainty, I think all of those would be reasons that people could go back and want to stay in the past and focus right. on the, like there was a time where I had four kids under six, it was busy and it was hectic, but they all listened to me and they were color coded and it was amazing. I can't make them color coded anymore. They buy their own freaking clothes and they won't use the same color cup every time. And they tell me to loosen up. I'm like, I don't like this game. So that in that area, I can see myself. And then when I'm not able to connect with the past and this steps into the next piece, I project yeah, to the see- future. It's like it's not yeah. that long and they're all going to move out and I don't have to worry about them anymore. But being in the it, present is not always comfortable. But let's so let's jump to the ghost of coaching future. Right? We all know people who future trip. And like mm. me working in recovery, I used to see and deal a lot with people that were future tripping. Right. Mm -hmm. Even now there are people that, you know, what am I going to do when I retire? You know, what am I going to do? Like, like back then it was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do when I'm a year sober or I'm five years sober, I'm 10 years sober. And the thing is, they're not living in the present. They're creating a state of non-presence by future tripping. Does that make sense? Yeah. The other one, just to bring that time frame smaller is the I'll do it tomorrow. How oh, yeah. often do yeah. we, it's like, oh, I'll do that tomorrow. This will be better tomorrow. Make it better now. I'm guilty. Do it I'm now. Guilty with, um, oh, guilty um, of that too. No, no, like, no, I'm not not the, uh, <laughs> well, actually, yeah. more recently, no. Uh, for some reason that disappeared. Um, but the uh, the living in the future, for me, I live in my goals. I live in my dreams. Um, so that dream of what I'm working towards is what powers me through the day and what just motivates me and excites me that sometimes it it's I'm in it so much that I forget the people around me that I'm 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 not fully present to the people I'm talking to or the people I'm around and that can kind of like not be good in that sense yeah yeah I mean me right I um I do this crazy thing called burning man And if I've honestly lately caught myself living in the future of what next year's Burning Man is going to be like to the point that I'm not doing the things I need to do today because I'm already attempting to get everything ready and do, and, and, and this, and this is going to be my 11th year. You want to know something? Somebody could tell me five days before you're going to Burning Man and everything would be prepped. And right now by like, I literally, I have an Amazon list that if I see something, it's like, oh, that would be great for Burning Man. Or if I see something for my trailer, oh, I need to put that on that list, right? And I'm not living in the here and the now. I have an island hopping list on Amazon. (laughs) I've got my tropical island list, like, so I get it. (laughs) And it's like, after we, like, like, there's a danger of somebody that is so future focused that they're missing the things around them today. I think either of these done to extreme can be Mm -hmm. quite detrimental. So past or future. Do you find that clients tend to have one that overweighs and overshadows the other more than the other? I would tend to say for my client, for my clients, since since I do a lot of work around trauma, 
a lot of my clients are literally wrapped around that trauma and they keep dragging that trauma into current events. And then depending upon the level of trauma, some of them will say, I can never trust blank, which ruins their future. And they are not in the present at all. Yeah. And the funny thing is, we all have trauma. Just because you didn't have something horrible happen to you, there are people that that have been clients of mine that literally their trauma was a, a an authority person when they were four, five, six, told them they were stupid or told them they were ignorant. And they have, in taking that past-based story on, they won't do anything because, well, you know, I'm too dumb to do that. I'm too stupid for that. It literally becomes a life sentence. So I would say most of my clients are past-based. Now, it was funny, working in, in recovery centers to the level I did, I also met this group that everything was about, I can't wait till I have 10 years clean and it's Mm, like it doesn't to that future based yeah and and like they weren't even you know it's like well you know it's fine I'm going to be 10 years clean in 10 years like and then I'll be able to you know and and at times right then I'll be able to actually make a difference for other people because I just want to make a difference for people and it's like no you've got to live in the here the now you've got to be in the present and if you're in the present pretty soon, you'll, you'll have your 10 years and your life is going to be far happier. To me, that is the power of a coach. Mm. I have a question for you, Jim, that I want to follow up with Angelito. Do you find your clients tend to be one way or the other in more past or future? That's for Angelito, so right? For me or for Jim? It's for you, Angelito. So do you find your yeah. clients are more past oh, for the future? Past, like, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, a, it's more about like, I've never done this before. I don't have what it takes mm-hmm. to do this. Um, it's it's more about learning something new and not having those skills. And the yeah, so they're more future the past, focused. Past. Um, past focused. Past. But, but for me personally, I wanted to um, add to uh, what Jim was saying on the flip side to that, just what I was experiencing two weeks ago, heavily in anxiety that I couldn't control, thoughts that were about, uh, that were making me anxious, that were all in my mind and hadn't come true, you know, but were literally paralyzing me from doing anything. So anyone who works with anxiety and panic and Mm -hmm. depression or whatever, you know, um, uh, where, the people that they're helping is imagining something in the future that isn't real or hasn't come mm. true. Right. They're, they're taking those fears and they're throwing them in the future. In the future. Yeah. I mean, we honestly, we are living in a post COVID world. Oh yeah. We, we have not experienced we keep, I keep looking and, and people are like, when is it going to get back to normal? There is no normal still. And, well, and that, well, that, and that's the, I want to hold on to what's familiar that I was saying about before. Yes. That's, that's the, I want to get back to what's familiar. I want to get back to what I know. I want to, and, and it is that holding, this is the new normal. This is the new normal. And tomorrow like, there will be another new normal. And in a month there will be another new normal. This is the new normal. And for everybody and waiting for normal like, is like, not coming. Like, yeah, waiting to get back to something that was, that's like, again, that gets back to Napoleon Dynamite and Uncle Rico, who literally, remember, if you watch the show, that's one of my favorite yeah. movies. He bought a time machine that was going to take him back so that he could actually make that pass so that he could be in the pros and like he wants to correct one error from the past. I don't and know if either of you how, watch, sorry, you go. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't know if either of you watch Big Bang Theory. There's an episode where 
Uh, and spoilers alert for anyone that hasn't watched it and wants to, but there's an episode where Leonard is looking to move in with Penny and Sheldon is tantruming about it. And um, he doesn't like all of the changes and he wants to get back to the past so much. He literally strips out their lounge room and goes back to just the lawn chair that he had when Leonard moved into with him like a decade before or something. And, and they walk in and Leonard goes to put the keys in the, like where they put the keys and it's not there. All the furniture is stripped out and he's gone back like a decade. Things like uni living and how sparse our places were for many of us. I had like a secondhand couch and a coffee table and that was it. I have far more in my house now. Um, but here's a tash and he's like, I am going to recreate. And they walk in, he's like, where is everything? Well, in my world, because I'm back in, I think it was 2012, he said, but I could have the year wrong. Uh, it is in my future. In your world and reality, it's stuffed in the uh, spare bedroom by an enterprising person that I pay. But he's so attached to things were good and what fucked it up was meeting Leonard. So I'm going to rewind to the moment before I met Leonard and erase that, the same kind of principle. Um, so we see this in movies and TV shows all the mm -hmm. time, people trying to get back to the past. Yeah. Yeah, and get back to some sort of glory. I mean, I mean, if I think about it, I were, and and, it, and it's actually interesting because I've been reflecting. It was in two thousand two, like I drove a Zamboni in the Olympics, and during the day I was a general manager and I was wow. making well into six digits. But I used to take off and I used to have to be at work every day at 4 p.m. at one of the facilities that I assisted in the design build process to drive a Zamboni. I had to do for six months, I had to work seven days a week, eight hours a day. I made eight, eight and a quarter or, or eight dollars and 35 cents an hour doing that. And that was the funnest job of my life zamming you know because 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 you have to learn on hockey rinks and then you move to the ice oval and there are times that i sit back and i reflect upon things like well you know if this wouldn't and, and, and again right a, a month ago something happened that the reflection upon that has blown me away because mm -hmm. that would have changed everything from 1986 to now and I keep coming back to, I can't do that. I have to live in the present. I have to live in the now. That's why, like between um, Christmas and New Year's, I will do a completion ceremony. I will probably do it once. It'll, it'll be about seven pages. And then I'm going like, like my new year is shaping up just, just to be brilliant. And I'm doing more work to actually design the success of my future than I have ever done as I've played around with this coaching career. I'm really curious, Jim, and I love what you're sharing. I'm really curious if you think the goal is that we should never look at the past or the present, uh, past or the future, and only no. be in the present, or if it's like an 80-20 ratio, or if there's not a, like, my, my logical and analytical brain oh, is I like, have an answer to how, that. How but much Jim. is too much? I'm so, curious your and, answer as well, Angelito. And, yeah, Angelito, go first. How would you answer that? Well, I mean, I've seen what it looks like to be fully present and have no control of um, looking into the future or ruminating about the past. I see it every day with my mom. She has zero control. She's fully present. Um, and like, that's that's what it looks like. So... Um, so she so she she has a disease that has her that her, she oh, has yeah, no she memory has, it's alzheimer's yes okay okay i, I just so, i didn't know it, oh yes it, if you haven't shared it before you, oh now... yes I, I think i've shared it in the past but I, yeah i assume that I, I always talk about it so it's like that, that's okay, right the difference for... between someone with alzheimer's thanks. and someone that's reached enlightenment yeah. of living in the well, present moment is profound yeah. well, well. And, clarification and, and and after angelito has this, i have a story also about that with a client that that was interviewing me and it, he, you know he didn't he didn't hire me but i went i would go and have talks with him and i'll tell about about the it, which is to me the other side of alzheimer's yeah. 
Well, so would you recommend that, Angelino, as a but, 100% but, only well, living no, in I the do, present? What I do recommend is, like, since we're not perched on the top of a hill meditating all day, um, that we accept the fact that we're human and that we sometimes ruminate in the past and sometimes um, think about the future. I think what we do is we just take from the past or the future and the present and do what feels good. And if it feels good to um, use the past, awesome. If it feels good to use the future for the present moment to get you inspired, to get excited about what you're doing, um, and just for the overall general well being, there's nothing wrong with using the past or the future. And there's no percentage. Why give yourself rules on? I'm only gonna um, do I like logic here and rules. And I'm only gonna do <laughs> yeah. Like, why would you go there when you can just allow your internal guidance system to just tell you whether you feel good or not? Where you live. The internal guidance system uses numbers. That's why. So, so do you remember? <laughs> but I do so, love what so, you're sharing, Angelina. I think. It's and and Angelina, I love what you shared, and it, and it you you triggered a story in me, right? And I am a storyteller. Do you remember when I said the lessons of the past? That's like, like, I really believe in learning from the lessons of the past. I once met a gentleman and, and I was, I was incorrect. He, he, he was not looking for a coach. One of my previous clients called me up and said, Hey, he said, you've got to meet this guy. And he wouldn't tell me any story. He says, and, and at the time he was a manager of a, of a board game store that sold mostly European board games. And I went and I sat with him and I was, you know, I said, could you show me a game? And he showed me a game. We actually played it. And I'm like, tell me a little bit about yourself. And he laughed and he says, well, he says, he says, you won't believe this. He says, but I don't have a past. And I was like, 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 but what? And he says, well, he says, here's what they tell me. He says, they tell me that I used to be this high paid lawyer and I was on this incredibly stressful case. And what they told me is one day I went out and it was like, everything was so stressful. And I went out and I took a drive. And he says, my first memory was about a month ago. And I'm just sitting on the side of the road in the car. I don't know who I am. I don't know what my name is. I don't know what I live. I don't know anything. And he says, like, they called the police. And I had this, this, he says, he says, I had a paper in my pocket that told me what my name was. He says, he says, you know, what's weird. He says, he says, a month ago, I met this woman that says she's my wife. And we're kind of ex like, I'm still living there. And I have these kids, but I have no memory. And I literally sat with him for two or three times before he quit because he was looking, he, 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 he told me that he had gotten long-term disability. So he says, financially, they say I'm set for life, but I've got to figure out something to do because I just sit home. And I said, and I look at these photos of who I used to be and I don't remember anything. And he says, so, you know, he says, I've got to find a way to create a life. And for some reason, and I talked to my former client um, who had insight from like had actually gone back and talked because he says, this can't be true. And, and, and supposedly this guy was under so much stress one day that he literally went out for a drive and, and in his mind did a control alt reset well, there was and he no lost accident? everything. There was no accident. He had just pulled over. And he was just sitting in traffic. He didn't know the city he was in. He didn't know anything. And he was just learning to get to know his family again. And so for people who say like, 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 well, you know, I'm not influenced by the past. That's why I talk about the lessons of the past. Mm. That's why I spoke to the lessons of the past because we are all, it is, I will often say in workshops that your past is perfect for you as long as you've learned your lessons. And, oh, and, and if we haven't learned the lessons that slap us in keep, the ass until we well, do. <laughs> well, 
if if you really think about it, they do keep coming back at you until you learn the lessons. And the other thing, right, coming back to the Christmas carol is quite literally, we can't live in the future. We have to live in the now with our eye on the future, knowing the lessons we've had in the past. Because to me, I would like to say that maybe I'm 40% in the present while reflecting 30% on the past while having my eye, maybe I'm 60% with, with like 10% towards my future numbers. goals. Well, you know, no, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm Different attempting drivers, to, Angela. I, know, I, I know, I know. And it's like, yeah, but it's like, I'm attempting to, because I know where my future goals are going to go but it's the work that I do right now that's going to create how my future unfolds. And it's the lessons that I've learned from the past that also have an influence on my present behavior. Sorry, that head shaking wasn't aimed at you. It was aimed at my husband who was trying to steal my tea. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Someday I want to meet that that magical man of yours. He's wonderful. Tea just appears. Um, I think that that lessons from the past in the Doctor Who version of the Christmas Carol, and I don't know if this happens in the original. There is a moment where, again, spoilers for anyone that hasn't seen it. Uh, there's a moment it's where. Just you. I'm just <laughs> Apparently, it possibly you. is just me, and that's okay. I'm okay to be the weird freak that watches Doctor Who, uh, and I have what I have watched this episode every year at Christmas for the last probably decade. Can you send the link? Can, se- I'll, I'll can share you po- can you post the link in Christmas the Empower Hour there? Um, I'll share which specific one it is, but in it there's a moment where the Scrooge figure whose name I can't think of in the, the Doctor Who one, but the, the Ebenezer, he says, well, aren't you meant to take me to the future? And Doctor Who steps aside. He said, I am. And the kid from this guy's past is watching who he becomes. And so the future isn't being shown to Scrooge. It's being shown to the younger version of Scrooge. And sometimes I think it's a really helpful perspective. I do this with my clients in my coaching every now and then imagine you with a five-year-old looking at who you've become do you love it and what's missing that that five-year-old dreamed for you so step into the five-year-old look to the future and how would you rewrite now to be who you wanted to be rather than necessarily so the future can be time traveling back to when we were five and looking forward was my point it's crazy it's actually that's timeline therapy it is time on therapy. Yeah. It is time on therapy. It's it's actually funny. It's actually let's see what's our time. I actually have a story. Like I think that happened in my life in real, because I remember back in 2010, um, back when I was in my coaching academy, it was a Friday night. I had a, like for some reason there was nothing going on, so I looked and this 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 human in LA was having this meditation night. And we went, I, I have an on and off relationship with meditation. I really do think it's powerful. I just don't think you should be doing it 24 hours a day. But I went to this thing. And for some reason, I was in one of those kind of a cross, kind of a grousy, kind of a grinchy mood that I was kind of pushing back. And she said that we're going to go to this meditation and you're going to go to your favorite place in the world. A door is going to open and there's going to be somebody there that you're going to have great impact on. And when we all went in and it was a room full of people. And when we all went into the meditation, she's like, you know, take yourself to your, to, to your most favorite place. And my most favorite place is a place. um, I have a cabin in Utah. And if you literally hike up three mountain peaks at the top, there is a forest where nothing grows straight, all these Aspen trees. And I literally, I was sitting there in my, in my enchanted forest, which is my own personal enchanted forest. And she says a door appeared and in the meditation between some of the crooked Aspen, a door actually appeared. And the instruction was to open the door 
and there will be a person on the other side that you are going to assist. Well, I opened the door and there was me at about 11, 12 ish, 13 ish. Um, it was after my, my trauma and there I was holding a knife and I was going to cut my wrist. And I literally went up to the young me and I just remember surrounding it with love and saying, you are, you, you are, you are okay. You do not need to do this. And the knife was put down and the deed was never done. And the funny thing was, is I had not remembered that at the time I started crying, but there was a time that I literally had, that I snuck a knife up from the kitchen and I was going to off myself. And for some reason I didn't do it. My takeaway is spiritually, I've always had my back. Always. Mm, that. And that was one of those moments. And I literally, like like this, the, the lady ended up, I, I shared what it was and she and I talked and we had tea after and she took me back to where I was staying. But it literally shifted my life knowing that I have my own back spiritually. Yeah, wow. Like, yeah, it's... Uh... But as story. you share that story, like it was, it, we share a similar, I feel like we share a similar story, um, except for mine wasn't through meditation. It was through the, my very first ayahuasca ceremony, since we talk about uh, sacred um, medicine and the timeline therapy was done not by a facilitator, but through mother ayahuasca, where I was taken back to a seven-year-old me and I was sitting on the um, on the, I can still see it. Like I can, the vision is very clear. I was sitting at the ed edge of the bed crying and mother ayahuasca told me to hug myself. And so I hugged the seven-year-old version. And from there, every, it, I just felt like from seven to the age that I was, I believe I was 27, um, the 10 years or whatever that had gone by, all of the things that like caused me pain just seemed to drift away. And, and then she like hugged me in this motherly, like unconditional love of mm -hmm. just being held in her arms. And from then on, that's when I started my healing process. Like mm -hmm. that, that was, it was, it was no longer like living in the past of allowing the past to just like shape who I was um, moving forward. After that moment, it was about healing. It was about like the positive side of things about like who I can be, who I can become. So it was, wow, very similar that yeah. you had that. So yeah. I have a similar journey as well in that there's a moment where I've gone back and I've healed what happened in the past. And then my future is, is transformed as, an, as a uh, ripple effect of that. Um, mine was going back to a defining moment that had come out several times but with coaches that generally couldn't navigate it with me they were not they hadn't done enough of their own work I believe mm -hmm. and so it was a night before so I had to show up as a jester the following day to a training this was before I'd done my work around stand-up comedy before I'd embraced my inner comedian it was one of the most terrifying prospects to show up and so I walked through the city of Melbourne dressed for full jester garb and makeup and showed up and I had to stay in character for the opening of the day. But the night before I was projecting into the future, terrified about this tomorrow. Um, and I remember going to bed and picking up a pillow and I was cuddling the pillow because I was just, I was terrified. I'm like, I've got, there's something I've got to soothe here, something I need to work through. And I went back to this moment as a six month old and I'm standing in the cot screaming, um, holding on, pulling myself up. I walked ridiculously early, um, but no one would pick me up. And so I've picked up this baby version of me and I've got the pillow and I'm rocking, like I'm simultaneously rocking the baby and being the baby rocked. And I, I ended up crying myself to sleep, but I, all of it was, I've got your back. You're okay. Mm -hmm. I woke up about an hour later and did some more soothing work around it. And in that moment, very similar to you, Jim, it's like, I've always had my back. And that moment for me goes back to six months old. Uh, and it's just this project. It's like, I, you've always, my mom said, you've always been independent. And I'm like, that is the moment 
And whether I time travel back to there or whether I'm just projecting it back, I don't know. But there was a very profound shift for me that night. And then the jester gave profound shifts as well. And it's sort of rippled and built on. I think that is a wonderful opportunity that we can give to clients to have that moment. And I didn't have the opportunity to complete that with a coach, but it's all of the coaches that I'd worked with that opened the door. And I think as coaches, we need to remember sometimes our job is simply to tell the person that the door is there. Yeah. And sometimes they'll open the door and they'll have that amazing experience in the conversation. Sometimes it's just, they're going to recognize the door. And then sometimes there's opportunities like you explained Angelita as well. So from a coaching perspective, sometimes our job is just to point out to our clients, there is a door. Now, whether they open the door in that conversation with us or whether it takes. So it would have been two years after I first uncovered that moment before I actually was able to sit with that moment. And that's okay. And the original coach, who I don't even remember who was, I'd love to send them a message and just say, that door you opened for me, now the ripple effect has has played through. I don't recall who it was. It was someone in a training session and uh, like we were just doing pair work in a room. And so... Mm -hmm there's hundreds of people it could have been but I think as coaches we need to remember that because often we can get consumed in I didn't see the transformation in my client in the session I didn't see the the progression it doesn't mean we didn't make a difference and for newer coaches that's such a key it's one of the things I used to say all the time when I was mentoring brand new coaches you opened the door that is enough that that just that tiny and it just doesn't seem significant enough for newer coaches they're looking for your experience Jim it's like he cried and he had this amazing breakthrough and this and which is wonderful for you but as coaches we don't need to have that significant it's just they well, saw there was a door that's all there needs I to be I agree with you 100 percent with that yeah and the other thing is co- like I have had um one of the reasons I moved is just there I've done so much work that I, you know, I've had people come up to me and they're like, remember me, remember me, remember me. And I'm like, I don't remember people. And they're like, they would tell me things I said. And it, they're like, that's made, that made the biggest difference in, in my life for the coaches out there. And then, and then also for people that are just listening, mm. remember those people that made the difference but I'm going to come back to remember the lessons they taught you, which have mm-hmm. you be present today. One of the things about the creation ceremony or, or completion ceremony is once you get done with the completion ceremony, you actually create. That's the goal part of it. You create what you're going to do in the next time period. Yeah. Then you have to be in the present because it is your work in the present that quite literally will give you the future that you create. And it is that work right now. That is why the present is so powerful. Oh, it's a little kitty. Hi. It's so powerful. Yes, she is. <laughs> she just, yeah, I know. Little kitty. So yeah, so as you are hearing, so, and I also have to thank both of you it's beautiful to hear other people, especially my peers that have had like it was because because to me, it's 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 always well, you know, it's like, it's just me. But it's beautiful that other people are having similar that means it exists in the world. And it's funny, because chances are we all and getting back to the theme today. To me, again, it's about the lessons from your past and living in how you create your present that will create a very empowered future. I have a slightly Any... left field question. So okay. I know we're doing past, present, future. I feel like we've covered that. There may be more to add and I'm, Angelita, you're welcome to add more. Not that you need my invitation. Um, what popped up in my head as you were talking about the forest, because we talk about dislocating ourselves in time, dislocating is probably or repositioning ourselves in time. And we can, we can travel back to when we were six months or seven years or 11 years or wherever it is and, and connect with and touch that part of our soul again. As you were talking about transporting yourself to the forest, I wondered if there is an equivalent of this for space. So in terms of time, we've got past, present and future. 
And ideally, we bring the lessons from the past and we look to the future and incorporate the past, present and future all together. And there is only the ever unfolding moment of now to poorly misquote um, Eckhart Tolle, I think it is. But I, 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 when you're talking about the forest, I'm like, is there an equivalent for space? And are there people that are longing to be in a different space when we can bring that space and the essence of that space to I don't know what the equivalent of the word now is in space, but that's where my mind just went as I get it's it's <laughs> as as you were talking about that. Have either of you watched the series 1899 on Netflix? Mm -mm, what is it? You have to watch it. Can what I get it a is. brief so so synopsis? so brief synopsis <laughs> is it's it's you're in this journey of people in the year 1899. Wow as they leave Europe going to America. And it is the adventures of how they unfold. And I'm not going to say any more than that, because I, although one thing it's, and if you're listening to this, and it's funny because I would actually like to get a group together and discuss the spiritual implications of the entire series, because it is, it is so brilliantly put together but the thing is, is if you watch it, you have to go into the dubbing and you can't go into the English dubbed. You have to go to the original in parentheses English. And then you have to go over to dubbing and you have to double it in English because there's like eight different languages. And if you're not, if you're not aware of the different languages, it ruins it. But it is, but, but Amy, to your point, it is one of the, it, it explores the paradox of where the mind lives. And I'm not going to say anything more because it'll ruin it, but it is one of the most powerful series that explores how the mind deals, like how the inner mind deals with things. I'd like to add something. Amy was correct. Um, that instead of ruminating, when you find yourself ruminating in the past or living in the future, and you'd like to invite more presence and in, uh, into your life, uh, I go with following your bliss. Joseph mm -hmm. Campbell sa said it like you follow your bliss and doors will open where there were no doors before. Right. And when you follow your bliss and you, do, you follow what feels good you naturally will take from the lessons of the past and you naturally will create uh, what you're looking for in the future. So there's no need to like work up in stress and stress yourself out. Like am I living in the future or am I living in the, or thing, living in the past? Like all that matters is how you feel in the present moment. And you've got to take whatever from wherever you can to get yourself in a state where you're feeling good, like genuinely feeling good. And that's it. You can only focus on, you know, what Eckhart Tolle says, the power of now, like in the, this is the only moment that is real, mm -hmm. like all of that stuff, you're, even the good stuff, Amy, like the scrapbooking days, it's no longer real. This is what's real right now. Right. But if it makes you feel good, awesome. Take from it, like feel good right now in the moment. So that's, that's the only, that's what I have to say about that. There's an ADHD coach that I follow, sorry, Jim, uh, who talks about following the dopamine, mm -hmm. which I think is probably very similar to the following the bliss. So and I, <laughs> he's <rather technical. laughs> um, but and I think he's trying to raise awareness. Like he, the, uh, he talks about a lot of the clinical diagnosis stuff and the, the chem brain chemical stuff, which is why it's, but it is equivalent to the follow the bliss and the, but the following the dopamine, um, which I really resonate with. I'm like, I can easily follow the dopamine. I think one of the reasons I hold on to the scrapbooking stuff is that I wonder if the dopamine for that will hit again. That's part of your but bliss. There, there is a moment of like, so that dopamine, I mean, that dopamine obsession, it lasted 15 years before I yeah. gave up on scrapbooking. And just it was, thinking it was about my it career the, yeah. and my purpose. Yeah. So just thinking yes. about it because the mind mm -hmm. does not know what's real and what's imagined. So just by um, thinking about it and, and 
allowing yourself transporting your your focus and attention to that moment Mm -hmm. creates that same level of dopamine that's why you feel it does yes yes absolutely um it doesn't create the the desire to actually do anything with it but i i hold on to it in case one day i feel like i do want to play with it again and and there was a lot of money went into Mm -hmm. that was my career for 12 to 15 years and so there was a Absolutely. lot of money went into tools, card stocks, papers, and yeah, just letting it go is beyond. It's the same as the reason I keep the planners in the garage. I've got far more boxes than I care to count of planners in my garage. There was a lot of time, energy, and sweat that went into it, but I don't do anything with them. They just sit there. And I really need to connect with a marketer that can help me move them. I was my like, how did you not pursue a, a uh, direction yeah. of teaching people how to scrap it? Because that's that's a very I did. I taught people, I taught people okay. how to scrap books. That was my very, job for years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it was a very lucrative business and I was doing amazingly in it. And one morning I woke up and it no longer fit. And I quit. It's like this is this is not this is not where I need to be anymore. I rang my manager, I said, I'm out, I'm done. And she said, You cannot leave. You are my like I was her best consultant. She came, she sat at my kitchen bench, and we both cried and she's like what are you going to do i said i have no idea but i know my path is no longer this i think on a professional level yeah it was huge oh you know here's and that's how i became a coach which is that transition that led me here so yeah which is perfect which is just just a perfect thing that it was like something in the universe said it's time to shift yep it was time and Beautiful. yeah, and I definitely in that moment, I don't know that it felt like bliss as such, but I definitely followed my gut. I followed my instinct without having any plan, having any inclination of where I was going to go. I quit my job two weeks later. I found my first coaching course. See, that's brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. So I know we just digressed, but that is the past and the present and the future all tying together. Yep. So you've been listening to Empower Hour. Thank you. It is another phenomenal interaction these next two weeks coach amy Mm. is going to be leading us and i really the more the more this gets shown to me between it's something called it's something called human design right the human design so we are going to there's some human designers inside of this group this community and it's and if it is what your human design profiler if you've done a human design unpack probably didn't tell you about your profile right Right. And here's the thing is I did mine a year ago. So when you wanted the information, I kind of rolled my eyes. But then when you began (laughs) digging into it, all of a sudden, I literally was like, now I know. So so these next two empower hours, join us as we unpack the human design. Yeah, well, with your permission. I'll unpack our three and how we... Oh, live. Okay, cool. live. So, do, uh, so Angelita, do, do you have permission to share yours? Because you have my permission to sure. share mine. Just, yeah. just, I just we were black just out. Mine. I was so excited. Yeah. I was like, but I'll share the time with yep. everyone else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perfect. All I'm going to ask for me is just black out the, the day, that, the time, the, does that the birthday match my stuff. Human de- does my personality match my human design, Amy? I don't That's know. what we're going to be seeing. A look we, okay. we, we need to chat before we do it live, just as a disclaimer, so that we work out which of your times is accurate because you've got okay. two different ones because okay. of the time because this so arrogance that you see is is just for play and for show this is not who i am <laughs> i do it for comedy but <laughs> the human design will let me know this yeah the truth okay everybody thank you and <laughs> have a phenomenal week we'll see you next week at the same time beautiful bye everybody <laughs>